Welcome to Real Life with Pastor Lynn Shaw of Amazing Grace Fellowship. We hope you are blessed as you receive practical insight into daily living. Join us now as Pastor Lynn brings an exciting word for you that will inspire you to live the abundant life God has for you. Here's Pastor Lynn. What was Luke, by the way? Physician. Just as a trivia, just as a comment, Luke talks about, so in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Luke, Luke always has details, it seems, that others, others don't, that would, which would stand to reason if you were a, a medical guy, if you are a doctor, I mean, if you know, you look at things a little bit different than just the average Joe, like a tax collector. Matthew, right? So Luke always brings some great insight. And I've, I've been wanting to move on um, from some of the miracles and stuff of Christ, but I just haven't been able to yet. So we're, we're going to get into another portion of Scripture that just is chocked full of a lot of stuff. So first, let's look at the first part of, uh, I actually am, am just going to kind of start out in verse one of chapter four, and we're going to, we're just going to go and we're going to, we'll, we'll get as far as this chapter today as, as seems good, and then we'll continue on. All right. So then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> returned from the Jordan and was led. So returned from the Jordan when, when, so what took place when he was at the Jordan? He was baptized, so this is what, you know, many, if, if many would say it this way, that kind of Jesus inaugurated his public ministry at what approximate age? 30. So can you imagine in three years what Jesus did? One of the, one of the gospel writers said this, that if we were to write everything that he both did and said, that there wouldn't be, you know, that there wouldn't be no, enough room to record it all, which, which doesn't mean that there wouldn't be enough physical, it, it was, it's a statement, it's a statement, an idiom that it just says, you know, we couldn't, we, we, we couldn't even tell you everything that he's done and did it in, in about three years, uh, which is incredible. Anyhow, so he was led, or he was, after he was baptized by who? Okay, John the Baptist, right? It says, being filled with the Holy Spirit. So, so the significance of that took place when? When Jesus came out of the water, what, what do we have in Scripture? It says that the Spirit did what? Descended upon him like a dove. And what did the Spirit of God say? This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Which, sorry, just another, just another deal from a theological slash trivia deal. When that, when that story happened, right there is the perfect picture of the Trinity. God the Father spoke, this is my beloved Son. Of course, Jesus was there, you know, so there's the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit descended on, upon him. So in the New Testament, um, in the New Testament, that's, that's the kind of foundational, you know, ground zero for the concept of the Trinity. Um, Trinity, obviously, is a word that's not mentioned in terms of Scripture. It's not it, you know, there's nothing that says, oh, this is the Holy Trinity. But so the Trinity is simply a word that, that theologians have devised that, that speaks to the truth of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Being tempted for 40 days by the devil... And in those days, he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. Okay, so a so, couple things here. How many of you know that the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our life, because it says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit, the, one of the things, the, these are just kind of tangential things that we can look forward to, that when the Spirit of God comes to dwell on the inside of us, how many of you know that he'll lead us? But you're, if you don't follow, you're, he's not leading so, so that's a, just a little subtle nuance for me. It's like, it's like uh, what is it? John Maxwell, I think, said years ago. He said, anyone who's leading when no one is following is merely taking a walk. <laughs> so there's times, and I think if we'd be honest, we've all experienced 
the leading of the Holy Spirit, but we didn't follow, so he didn't lead. Does that make sense? Uh, so just think about that. So the, the only way the Holy Spirit can truly lead is if somebody's following. And, you know, so in my life, it's, it's I think there's sometimes people just want to look at the Holy Spirit as an intel guy. He's just the intelligence guy and I'll tell him stuff. Maybe, you know, the Holy Spirit tells us stuff for a purpose. The Holy Spirit gives us insight for a purpose, right? Uh, and, and when he leads us, the only way it can be called leading is when we follow. So that's not always easy. It's not always fun. Have, has the Lord ever asked you to do something that you knew was his leading, but for whatever reason you didn't do it? How many of you would raise your hand and say, I didn't do it? That's happened to me. All, you know, I think anybody, if, if we're at all aware, I think all of us have probably failed in following the leading of the Lord for whatever reason. Sometimes it's just tough on our flesh. Sometimes it's just, we, we just are rebellious. Some, it just all depends on kind of where we are. And, and what, what's interesting is there's times that the Lord will ask us to lead us, and then we'll come back to the Lord and try to inform him that what he's asking us to do really isn't the smartest thing to do. Right? We've all been there. So Jesus is our example. So he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness. Um, that's a whole other topic that I want to talk about at some point, is, is desolate places. Um, one, of the, one of the hallmarks of Jesus, um, so I've just been spending my time reading in the Gospels, and one of the hallmarks that has just kind of really stood out to me is these times that Jesus pulled himself away, and, and, and the... One of the ways it always comes out is Jesus pulled himself away to a desolate place and prayed. Pulled himself away to a desolate place and prayed. And we see this again here. So um, he fasted for 40 days. He ate nothing. Afterwards, when, when they had ended, he was hungry. When the days had ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, so this now is going Going back to now, he's in the 40 days, right? Said, and the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. If you're the son of God, now how many of you know that the devil knew that he was the son of God? So here's what's important. There's sometimes, usually when the enemy comes to us and tempts us, because the enemy will tempt us, right? And and how many of you know the enemy knows the truth? The reason he's so good at deception, because he knows the truth. It's only when you don't know something that I couldn't, I couldn't deceive you in engineering. <laughs> right? I, I couldn't deceive you into building an airplane that I knew wouldn't fly. Why? I don't know enough about... Um, airfoils and stuff like that. I, I know enough to make you crash. I can fly, but I, I couldn't go into the engineering of what, what, what the square footage of the wing square footage and, and you know, what the cord needs to be. You know, the, the wing cord can, can, has a little bit of parameters it can go, but you know what? I could, the, the devil can deceive because he knows the truth. And he knows the truth really, really, really well. And so the reason he can deceive us in that is because he knows the truth so well, and we usually don't know the truth so well, and we'll, follow, we'll swallow hook, line, and sink or something he said because we're not up to snuff on the truth. And how many of you know he can make the truth sound pretty, pretty believable, pretty plausible, right? If you're the son of God, then why don't you command this stone to become bread? So, how I many of you know one of the first things that the enemy will hit you, hit you with is something that's pretty obvious, right? So, do you think maybe that talked about food? Why? Jesus wasn't eating. He was hungry. So, we don't know what we don't know. It doesn't say, and on the first day of his 40 days in the wilderness, it doesn't say that. We don't know the chronology of this necessarily, but, but it's... What is sure is that when you fast for 40 days and eat nothing, I guarantee you've battled the idea of hunger. 
right? So he says, if you're the son of God, command this stone to become bread. So stop and think of it. Has miracles taken place in the life of history that we have with people? Yeah, Old Testament is filled with, filled with miracles, right? I mean, Acts Axe heads floated to the top of water. People were raised from the dead. I mean, there's, water stood at attention until, you know, a few million people walked through. I mean, so miracles were, were not that big of a deal. And miracles happened at the hands of mere men. Right? So it only stands to reason if you're the son of God. I mean, dude, if there's anybody that could perform a miracle, it ought to be the son of God. Right? So Jesus responded and said, It is written, underline it is written if you don't have it, or I guess if you're looking on a iPad or something like that, highlight it or something like that. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Right? So Jesus quotes from the Old Testament. How many of you know the Old Testament is the Word of God, right? Sometimes it's, it's, it's important to just get this in their brain. There's a lot of people that have the idea that since we're New Testament Christians, you know, only the New Testament kind is valid to us. I just want to encourage you. The Lord himself quoted from the Old Testament, right? And, and the idea is, is this. Could have Jesus turned that stone into bread? He could have, right? But here's what's really important for the wrong reason. That's really important. He could have, but for the wrong reason. What would have the reason been? To combat the enemy, which your brain could go, well, it's not too bad. But simply to show his power, to just show how powerful he was, that's not a right reason, right? So Jesus, this temptation with his flesh. So what you're going to find, um, we're not going to go into it in depth, but all sin can be broken down into three areas. See if you can tell them for me. The pride of life. Say what? Lust of the flesh. Right. So all sin can be broken down into one of those three areas. Jesus was tempted in three areas. And, and the ideal model that he showed for us is how we overcome temptation. How many of you were tempted this week? We were all tempted this week. The only way you weren't tempted, maybe, was while you were sleeping. Stay tuned. We will be right back with Pastor Lynn Shaw after these brief messages. Can't make it to service? That's okay. Just head to hgf.org and click on the Watch Live sidebar link during any service and watch us live. Wednesdays at 7 p.m. or Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. Great for when you're traveling or for those who are away at school. Church over the internet, what will they think of next? Amen. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. It's actually wrong, but I'm not going to tell you the right answer, okay? Jesus answered, it is written, so let me just encourage you. It, it's important that we get, we, we get the truth of God's word in our hearts, which, which let me just say, that doesn't mean that if you, if, if, if you can't quote, if you can't memorize something perfectly, it doesn't mean that then, then, then you're disqualified. Listen, the principle of the truth of God's word needs to be in our hearts so that when temptation comes, we're able to say, it is written. Here's what the word of God says. And, and why, why the, the reason that that's so important is because, listen, if, if we just try to not think about it, if we just try to ignore, how many of you know the enemy is great at um, persistence? Isn't that right? And so what the enemy's done to Jesus is the enemy has presented to Jesus an alternate truth. The Son of God can take a stone and turn it into bread. That is the truth. The Son of God can take a stone and turn it into bread. That's true. The kicker is, in the context of right, for that moment, 
that would be the wrong thing to do. Right? But, but how Jesus com- combated and countered the temptation was to go back to the Word. What does the Word of God say? Because at the end of the day, the Word of God is our source of absolute truth, and it's the final say on everything. So I just want to encourage you. For what that means for you and I as believers, it means that, first of all, we don't have to succumb to temptation. But I'll say this. If we try to combat it just with our own will, or just with our own grit, with our own whatever, if we try to conquer it that way, in time we will fail. Because why? The arm of flesh, Jeremiah says that the arm of flesh will fail us. But one sure way, one sure way that we can conquer temptation is to base, base our resistance to the Word of God. What does God's word say about this? Well, then that tells me right off the bat that me as a Christian, I'm going to have to keep my face in the word. I'm going to have to keep my nose in the word of God. I, I, I can't get through life outside of it successfully. Jesus said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me. And you know what the devil said right there was absolutely true. That's one of the things that many Christians don't realize when they look at just things. Well, why doesn't God just step in? Because let me tell you what, the, the, the Lord of this world is the devil. When, did it, when was it delivered to him? In the Garden of Eden. So this world system, this whole thing, is under the control of the wicked one. Isn't that right? And mere human resistance will not conquer it. Right? But we have this group called the church. And how many of you know the church doesn't have to abide by the Lord of this world? Are you, are you with me? So, so we, we don't have to abide by that. In fact, one of the things that it's a whole different topic, but one of the things that the church is to do, God's people on the earth today, one of the things that we're to do is, you know what? So the enemy has every right, every right. I hate, I hate that he does, but he has every right to mess in the world. It's his domain. But one thing that, the de- how many of you know that, that the devil is the father of all lies? And there's a lie in this temptation that's for certain. That's not the, that's not the lie. It was delivered to him. Authority in this world system was delivered to the devil. Okay? But here's the lie. All this authority I will give you and their glory. For this has been delivered to me. And I give it to whomever I wish. Wow. You think there's any kings in power? Any presidents in power? Any public people in power in some nations of the world that got their power directly from the devil? Pretty obvious. Right? But look. Therefore, here's where the lie is. If you'll worship before me, all will be yours. Now think about that. All. How big is all? A double L, biggest word in the Bible. All will be yours. Do we honestly think that the devil would deliver all of his authority to Jesus? No, that's a lie. But it sounds good, doesn't it? It, does, it doesn't sound too far off. It's just a, just a little bit off. Never forget this, Satan can't consistently and wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, tell the truth. There'll always be a twist. There'll always be a twist. What did Jesus respond? He said, get thee behind me, Satan, there again, for it is written. Folks, do, you, do, you, do we realize as Christians how important it is to, uh, uh, to, to um, get on the inside of us. Paul admonition to the, to the church. Study to show yourself approved of God. A workman that needeth not correction, that we're rightly able to divide the word of truth. Everybody say rightly able. 
The reason I say that is rightly, Abel, because listen, have you ever been around somebody that took the word of God and put an interpretation on it that you just know is not right? I tell a funny story, uh, but it's sad. You know, it all worked out good. But when we went to Nova Scotia, um, one of the board members of the church um, was, I don't know, how much older are they than us, babe? Probably five years, something like that. Um, Ex-hippie. I mean, I mean, if you and if you could picture his wife, if you could picture a, a flower girl, that's her. A flower child, yeah. I mean, sweetest couple in the whole world. Okay, so when they got born again, um, they were they were the, they were they were leading a hippie lifestyle, right? Okay, so toked. And I like to use that word. I've never done it, but it, you know, whatever, toked. So they smoke marijuana all the time. Marijuana was just a part of their life. They give their heart to Jesus Christ, have a, have a full-on head-on collision with Jesus, fell head over heels in love with Jesus, but for a long time. I don't know how long, but it was more than a year. They never changed their marijuana habit. Tell somebody... In the church, now they weren't board members at that time, okay? But the church that they got born again, somebody came alongside them in discipleship. That's why discipleship is so important. And realized that, you know, whenever you got around Ralph, you could smell weed. I mean, you could just smell it from what I understand. And uh, so for a long time, their, their marijuana habit never changed. Illegal is all get out, you know, blah, 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 blah. When he was confronted about it, here's what his answer was. And it was sincere. It was sincere. That, well, we don't, we don't smoke marijuana outside the marriage bed. To which the person told, what does the marriage bed have to deal with this? And they said, well, the word says. They, 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 they were studying to show themselves approved to God. And the word says that the marriage bed is undefiled. So they would put all of their paraphernalia up in their marriage bed and they made sure their foot didn't touch the ground. And on their marriage bed is where they sm smoked marijuana. Now let me just ask you a question. <laughs> it's actually a funny picture, I know. You just want to laugh. But was that rightly dividing the word of truth? Did they know the word of truth? Yeah, they could quote scripture. And they could quote scripture on it. I'll never forget, I was talking to a, um, a guy that we had prayed for years and years ago. It was, this is a long time ago, in the early 90s. I've never smoked other than uncle whoever comes to visit you and they smoked. And my brother and I at times would go get one of their cigarette butts and then go outside and because, you know, we never smoked, go outside and light the little cigarette butt that had that much on it and smoke it. And, you know, we'd take one whiff of it and we'd cough and, you know, gag and whatever. And that's the, but I, so I never, I don't know what that habit is. Um, I understand that it's a tough habit for a lot of people to break, right? But what's crazy is over the years, God has used me um, to help people get over that habit. It's like a lot of times that happens if you've had that, right? And you're able to communicate. But my communication is, is and, and I felt like the Spirit of God told me this, so that's why I tell everybody. It's like, so here's the deal. We're going to pray and we're going to break that stronghold in your life physically and physiologically. But here's what you have to do. What you have to do is after you leave here, whenever you feel that urge, I don't know if it's before you go to bed. I know a lot of smokers, I guess, first thing they do when they wake up is they want to light a cigarette. If that's if it's one of the best tastes in the whole world. It's like, okay, whatever. But if you'll do this, so we're going to break that spiritually. So the next time that you feel the urge and the cigarette wants to come out, you pull it out and you just say this, in the name of Jesus, I believe that it was broken in my life and I'm not going to smoke anymore. And if you will throw it away, you'll find that together. And you know what? There's been two people that I've ever, and I've prayed for tons of people. There's been two people that 
it never worked. And in both cases, one of them came up to be prayed for. I prayed for them. They told me the next week, they go, you know, I really don't want to, I don't want to stop. So they weren't set free. And the other person went to the word of God, went to the word of God and came back with a scripture for me. So he came back and he says, you know what? Um, I've got freedom to smoke now. I said, okay. He goes, yep, I've got the word of God on it. I said, okay. What would that word be? He said, it says in scripture that a smoking flax, he will not quench. <laughs> and he goes, so I can smoke. I said, okay. And he said, so your prayer didn't work. To which I responded, no, you just want to smoke. And you're, you're not rightly dividing the word of truth. So I asked him the question. I said, okay, so I have a scripture that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Can you look at me in the eyes and tell me that smoking is good for your temple? I don't know. I don't know about that, but the Spirit of God showed me that scripture that a, that a smoking flax, he will not quench. So I'm going to smoke. He smokes still to this day. Is that rightly dividing the word of truth? It's not. So listen, I'm, I, I just want to encourage us. So I know some people go, well, yeah, but when I signed on to become a Christian, I didn't think it was going to be work. It's not work in the sense of bleh. But we just ask ourselves, do we want to be able to overcome temptation? Do we want to be able to overcome things when the enemy comes to our life and tempts us with this, that, or the other? Because how many of you know the enemy is not voting for you to win? Amen? He's not voting for you to win. He actually wants you to not only fail, but he wants to absolutely have you fail and, and flame out. He wants to just take you out of the whole race, right? He wants you to come to a spot in life that you just give up on God. So here, the second one d deals with what? Pride, right? How many of you know pride goeth before a fall? Jesus combated this temptation by again quoting the word of God saying, you shall worship, it's from the book of Deuteronomy, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. So what Jesus is saying to the enemy, he's saying, listen, no, 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 no. No, I'm not fallen for that because there's only one and one that's the most important person in our life. How many of you know that's good for us? What could stand between us and God? It could be a lot of things, couldn't it? It could be position, it could be money, it could be a job, it could be, it could be finding our identity in this, that, or the other. But you know what? Thank you for watching Real Life this week. Tune in next week for another exciting message on real life. Or come see Pastor Lynn Shaw in person here at Amazing Grace Fellowship at 1061 Eastland Drive North. Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We'd love to see you there.